Thank you. I want to start uh, first off by thanking Catherine and Ronnie for organizing this and for inviting me here. As I've said, on, on many trips to Manhattan, I've attended events here, and it's truly an honor to be on this side of the podium. So thank you for that. And then I also want to apologize for being so late. Um, I know that that's not respectful of your time, so please uh, accept my apology. We started out at you know, about 5 o'clock in the morning at Fox and Friends, and we've literally you know, gone nonstop up until the, the final stop at CNN a few minutes ago. And when one interview goes late, it just kind of piles up, and then everything is late. So I sincerely apologize. And what I want to do tonight is really address what's on your mind and answer your questions, um, not just about the book or about the 2010 campaign, but also about moving forward. So I'm going to try to keep my remarks short so we can quickly get to the Q&A. Um, I want to start by talking about why I wrote the book and what I hope to accomplish with this book. I wrote the book because our party is certainly at a crossroads, and there's a division. And going forward, I truly believe we have to unite. As a matter of fact, I extended on, um, on one of my Fox interviews today an invitation for Karl Rove and I to kiss and make up <laughs> so that we can go forward a united party. Um, but I wrote, I do talk a lot about the cronyism of especially the Republican Party in Delaware, which those leaders have been ousted. But the reason I bring that up is not to perpetuate it or, or to, to fan the flames, but to put it to rest and to say that, you know, if, if that, uh, you know, that, that crony crowd would embrace the principles that the grassroots crowd, that our party was founded on, not just our party, but our country was founded on, we will be a powerhouse if we can unite. And I detail some of the things that my campaign has endured and what I went through as a candidate, again, uh, to, to illustrate a point of what happens when we divide instead of when we unite. And, and everybody knows, it's, it's no secret that, that the 2010 elections, um, the Republican Party was divided. But I think that there are some examples to look at. And I draw the contrast between Kentucky and my own race, where in Kentucky, we had the NRSC and we had Senator Mitch McConnell really campaigning against Rand Paul. You know, he was the worst thing to happen to politics until he won the primary. The day after he won the primary, the two, you know, Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul were arm in arm and they were saying, that's the past. We've got to move forward to make sure this guy crosses the finish line. And unfortunately, that didn't happen in Delaware. But it's got to happen in order for us to win in 2012. So that's the message that I hope that people can take away with them by reading this book. I tried to tell the story of uh, how I got involved in politics and um, what made me embrace the principles that I did and why I chose to become a Republican. And I told it in a way that some political advisors have have said was a little too honest. I probably shouldn't have admitted some things. But I did that, again, um, so that the reader can relate. Because it's not about how many mistakes we've made or if we've ever fallen. Because you simply cannot pretend to be perfect. It's too exhausting and too weary to keep up that facade. We're human. But what it's about is about whether you get back up again whether you're willing to own up to your mistakes and whether you're willing to correct your mistakes and whether you're willing to, to, to forge ahead and in spite of the opposition. So that's why I chose to address many of the things that I did in my book and, and talk about it, uh, where I came from and some of the hardships that I personally endured um, so that people can be inspired to get involved. When I was on the campaign trail, I met so many people, you know, and, and in the last chapter I talk about one of the stories where my sister and I, my sister Jenny, um, was working with me on the campaign trail, and we stopped to get gas, and she ran in to, to pay the, the woman behind the counter, and when she saw the O'Donnell for U.S. Senate sticker, the woman said, you know, 
tell your sister we're really rooting for and we really hope she wins. And, and then she went on to very clearly articulate her frustration. And of course, Jenny said, well, you can do more than hope that she wins. You can vote for her. And her response was very telling. You know, she said, oh, you know, I'm not political. I'm not the type who votes. And I chose to tell that story, not to shame her, but because there's this mindset that, you know, a certain elite control the political party. And they forget, or not just the political party, but the political establishment on both sides of the aisle. And, and the people who are impacted by this policy forget that you can get involved. Not only can you get involved, but you must get involved. So I talk about some very practical application. And you here in this room, especially the Republican women, you guys are the leaders, and especially being Manhattan Republican women. <laughs> you know? I've often said women politicians have a double standard. Conservative women politicians have a, you know, face it even more, a double whammy. Republican women in Manhattan, you guys have a triple whammy. So I really hope that this book can inspire you, that in spite of the opposition that you might face, that in spite of what might seem like you know all the odds against you, we have a winning message. And the beginning part of the book is the story, how I got involved, where I came from, how I got involved in politics. And um, you know, maybe we'll get to it during the Q&A, but I'll tell you now, quite honestly, I got involved because I thought the boy signing up at the College Republican table was cute. <laughs> and um, they were paying $75 a day to go pass out literature on election day. And what college student, especially in the early 90s, would turn down that large sum of money? So although my motives might have been a little wrong to begin with, I found that I truly stumbled upon something that I loved. Being in that environment, and, and especially this was in North Jersey, um, I got to talk to some of the local candidates and ask them questions. And, you know, I was a little too naive to realize that you can't ask these candidates these challenging questions. But, you know, why do you stand for this? Why do you take this position? You know, in case I knock on a door and they ask me about this, can you explain this? And, you know, and, and that sort of... Um, curiosity got people's attention, and then from there, you know, what, what might not have started out as the right reasons, it, it, it tapped into a passion in me, and I realized, I like what these Republicans have to say. I think I'm Republican, and I, you know, I don't know what I was registered at the time, quite honestly, but then there I found myself, I got invited to um, then actually work on the Bush quail campaign as a youth leader at the convention in Houston in 1992. And again, just being a curious college student, asking people questions, and, and that, um, you know, the people who were around me embracing that and not looking down that, that I was young, that's what brought me into my political career. And, and then I close it with some practical application about the principles that the Republican Party stands for. Because again, these are not just the principles on which our party was founded. These are the principles on which our country was founded. And I try to give some very practical application about the policies that we need to embrace moving forward and what we can do for those people like the woman that we met at the gas station who said, I'm not the political type. I get it. I used to think that. And then suddenly I found myself the political type, very much the political type. You know, but again, you have to get beyond that mindset. So I close the chapter with some practical application. But some of the policy stuff that I talk about, uh, there's a, a chapter that I call the freedom food chain. Because one thing that you know, we all are saying is that government is too big. The size of government you know, exploded under Barack Obama. And recently, I've heard some, some Democratic pundits saying, you know, don't those Republicans get that that's a good thing? Big government is a good thing, and government is supposed to take care of its people. And, and unless we can clearly articulate why no big government is not a good thing, we're going to lose. And then I also talk about, uh, there's a chapter called Defeating the Power of the Soundbite. Because, you know, again, especially being in Manhattan, sometimes you might feel frustrated that all around you is this liberal commentary, this misinformation put out there. 
I, of all people, understand that frustration of the misinformation. But yet we have power right now. Information technology has put the power.